if it's not terribly good, you might ask the question again for the purpose of the recording, and we'll, we'll throw it out, sure. if you don't mind. I do apologize, sure. Guido. Sorry, Guido. No, no worries. No, I guess the, uh, the question uh, that I have is just built on what Adrian was mentioning about the system having us by the throat. And, uh, and, and I thought, since it, I, I always thought, and for years, not just for years, I thought the system had us by the throat already, so completely. Mm. Where it has, and the, the number one blackmail it has on us is the job. And, and this has been true for so very long, and it has perfected that kind of blackmail so perfectly over the years. And I'm talking, I'm talking for decades and decades now, that I was wondering why would they have to engineer all these shows and spectacles like 9 11 and terror and the virus and this and that, which are just big theatrical productions that are just conceived to scare us into, into making us do things that we wouldn't otherwise have done, and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And I would have imagined that they wouldn't need to play these games anymore. So obviously, my presupposition was wrong. They're not done. And so the two questions that I just addressed now are, and I just posed are, are they, why are they not done? And uh, so they, they do not have us so completely by their throat as they wish they did. And the second point is that are there any indicators and indices and gauges they look at that tell them, you know, that they're not there yet and they need to push forth? Yeah. Silas, I can, do you want to answer this, Silas, or shall I no, prep it off? No, please continue. Well, the, the indicator, if I may, Guido, is the presence of Homo sapien. That's a big problem because Homo sapien has a fractal of the divine essence within him or her self. So the long term objective is to create a system that is, to use Silas's term, in a state of autopoiesis. It's a perpetual motion machine where they never have to worry about descent. They never have to worry about uh, being knocked off their throne. They never have to worry about uh, the power mechanism falling apart. So to answer your question succinctly, to change, why have they not stopped? They need, as we understand it, to re-engineer man in such a way as they extinguish the fractal of divine essence from man. Once that is extinguished, you now have what they term homo deus, or what we might term uh, bastard man. Now, bastard man is man that's been removed from the father. He, it's man that has been removed from nature. And the methodology for doing that may include advanced psychological techniques, the use of medicine, propaganda, uh, change in, you know, it's an attack on natural law, an attack on logos, etc., etc. So over a period of time, you'll be left with a husk, uh, a huskified man. A huskified version of, of man who will be far easier to control. So um, to use Huxley's line, you know, you can do everything with bayonets except sit on them. So they want to kind of get the, the, scenario, the thing into a kind of a point where they no longer have to use force. And that will A, involve extinguishing the existing spark within man as I know that how, how grand of a concept that sounds, but that seems to be what they're at. And once they have done that, they'll, um, in its place, they'll uh, put in their own kind of ideology and they'll reshape man to be, uh, you know, forever and ever more uh, a subservient entity. Silas? I, I would agree with that. What I would say is the thing that really impedes them from achieving autopoiesis, what, you know, a self regulating system that is out with the bounds of, you know, entropic effect is really based around that unpredictable, unpredictable element within man, which is the mm. spirit. Mm. It's that principle of God, or I, I like to think of it as that initial thought, right? That thought, that essence of vitality. Um, and that has always been a problem <clears throat> within any ideology um, that, that, you know, wishes to bring about a sort of either global or regional command and control uh, economy or uh, society, uh, what have you. So the, the only way one can regiment the entire species 
as as we see Harari stating or all of these various sort of stakeholder capitalists um, in this new system within its nascent stages is based around uh, genetic hacking, reimagining man as Zealstead, um, reformulating him and uh, obviously reconditioning him from the, the sort of uh, genetic level up again to uh, either eclipse or to tamper with or to destroy or to even just mitigate um, either partially or fully that in, you know that inherently uh, that inherent principle of God within each and every one of us that spirit that unpredictable element um, and again you can even look at look at it from a, a fairly secular point of view as well just by you know that unpredictable element that they can't control the mind directly as we were mentioning they have to change the the environment again through propaganda through uh, the, the the reformulating of of the informational landscape which is man's environment uh, that's the only way they can control man so it's an in, it's an inefficient or indirect way in which they wage their psychological warfare and maintain their power uh, and maintain their position. So, autopoiesis, again, the cyberneticists were talking about this way back in the 50s and, and what have you as well. Um, I mean, this goes way, way back. You can even see the, you know, the, the, the very fundamentals of this within Gnosticism, Hermeticism, uh, even Kabbalah. Even Kabbalah, these ideas um, surrounding the Adam Kadmon, the Tikkun Olam, you know, the, the sort of kernel of this idea was, or the seed of this idea was contained within uh, those sort of ancient philosophies. But yeah, it's, it, it really is based around that, you know, taking out the spirit, taking out the, the vital essence that, that, you know, maintains man. Um, within his sort of uh, unpredictable state, as we see now. So they have to control him directly uh, by sort of reimagining man. That's what I would say. If um, if you were in the shoes of the, uh, let's call them the oligarchs and whatever, is, is there anything that you see right now and what's going on in the world that would tell you, oh, this is not good? When you say, uh, I, I agree. I mean, what you, I, what you say for me, as I say, I call it to insectify society, turning us into bugs, basically. That's what they're mm. in the, and, and, and I'm being studying bugs, and social bugs, uh, slave making ants. And I've, to me, that was just a universe. I mean, I had no idea how extraordinarily fascinating that is and how close we are to them. It's not the mammals, we don't resemble, we resemble them very little. But the slave-making ants, it's extraordinary. It's like Shakespeare dramas you go through and how a queen invades another nest and has to decapitate the queen. I could go on for hours. Mm -hmm. If we tell you what I've read, it's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. But if you were to put yourself into these slave-making, the slave-makers, you know, from their viewpoint, is there anything in this day and age that you, when I'm speaking of indicators, that you look at and he says, well, this is not good. This is still there and it shouldn't be there. Could you, would you, what if, could you make an example of what it would be? Well, there, Silas might remember the term, but there's, a, if we're to believe the reports are true, first of all, there, we have kind of reports of a social phenomenon in uh, China where young people basically seem to have kind of dropped out. And a, Can you remember the term, Silas, of this culture? In English, it's called lying down culture. And what happens is, like, if you push too hard... Rather than compliance, uh, you get a type of collapse and people will just join out of the entire system. They'll become sort of dropouts, if you will. They'll refuse to work. They'll kind of just be like, you know, shoot me now. If that's what you want to do, I'm just not doing anymore. So that might be a concern where, where as you might impart force too heavily, too quickly, onto a social body and instead of dissent or rebellion you'll actually get a kind of a collapse and you get a phenomenon of people joining out really and kind of just becoming totally disaffected with society and disillusioned and they won't want to participate in anything at all 
So it'll become a, a rebellion of apathy, if you will, a kind of a, a kind of an implosion. So something like that might pose concern. But to answer your question in a different way, like we've we've had this conversation recently about this concept of dissent. For example, what we're doing now, talking in this way and observing, attempting to observe the system in this dispassionate, uh, objective manner, is perhaps dissent. But the question is: is is there any room for dissent at this point? Is is the has that uh, horse already bolted? And um, you know, to to make the point in a different manner, would they be concerned about the likes of us chatting here online? Would they be concerned about people? attempting to understand what what was going on would that be an element of concern and you know perhaps it is not because at the end of the day and it's again i think it's one of harari's points anything that's creating data is of value to the system so essentially now we're speaking online we're we're throwing ideas around we're attempting to analyze we are producing data so perhaps in a way we're we're of value to the system because we could be used by the system to calibrate so we sure. could be used like a light on your dashboard to tell you that, you know, you need to top up the engine oil or, uh, you know, the, the water's low on the radiator. So we're, we're a bit like that. You know, we, we tell the system, you know, there's concern here. These people are asking questions and um, they seem to have an awareness of what's going on. You know, it's a bit of worry. But uh, that, outside, go ahead. No, I'm just, no, I know Silas wants to say something, but and I'll just interject. Um, it's, it's a friend of mine who just got, was flabbergasted because he got a, he got an email from Amazon just proposing to him a variety of conspiracy uh, documentaries. They say, yeah. hi, Joe, <laughs> wouldn't you love to watch this and then the other? I was yeah. thinking, you know, God damn it. I mean, they, they even throw in conspiracy theory at me because they know what I like, you know. So, yeah, so I, 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 think we're, I think we're just guinea pigs, you know. Yeah, but it's like, you know, I, I, it was only like... We read. I read your essay there uh, recently, Guido. You sent me one of your essays, and you made the point that the power structure has disappeared, or it's no longer visible. And like online here, we've had a lot of discussions trying to understand who are they and what is the nature of they. And I suppose, for example, the British Empire, the Roman Empire, um, communism in Russia. We always knew who they were. We we knew who the various figureheads the military, you know, the, the stuff that happened. But all of a sudden, there's just an empty space. And it, was, it wasn't until I read your essay, it kind of hit me. Yeah, okay, now it's it's obvious. They've, they've disappeared, the power structure, and it's part of the game that you've got no one to shout at. There's no customer complaints department because there's no organization, there's no chef in the kitchen. The kitchen itself has disappeared, so you can't complain about the meal. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no one home anymore. And it's, it's, it's uh, again, Huxley pointed, I think, Huxley had a comment about that, that the, you know, the, the empire of the future wouldn't be, would not be the Orwellian uh, use of violence in the boot on the face. It would, it would disappear altogether. And again, to use his, his, his line, you know, you can do everything but bayonets except sit on them. Uh, it would be the public themselves who would acquiesce to the input, shall we say, and would buy in. And would own nothing and be happy, and you know this. This brings up a very complex kind of a problem that, if we imagine, you know, the inside in Plato's cave, and uh, you know, you have these people who are locked in there and they're staring at the shadows, thrown by the candlelight on the wall, and we we run in there and we break down the gate of the cave and we beseech them, come on, you can be free, you can be free, let's get out of here, and they don't want to move. And they're looking at you like going, what the hell's your problem, man? It's great in here. You know, so you have a very weird problem in that um, dissent, if that's what we're doing, may not have really any place in this structure. And if you're to assume that power itself now has a a post-structural meaning and essence and form, so perhaps also has dissent, what you might call dissent. So it, it, it throws up a whole new... A whole bunch of questions as to how to even understand how the whole thing fits together. It's still, you know, it's still very difficult to understand because you are into that kind of, they've awakened that you know, post-structural kind of genie and everything has been reframed and is abstract and has been uh, smashed to pieces and glued back together in a different form. And everything's kind of P- Picasso-like and James Joyce-like. 
uh, Ulysses, you know, it's, it's all been scrambled. Like, so I think it has actually affected people's minds as well, you know, essentially, of the masses, perhaps. I, I would say as well that, you know, of course we have the, the general elements of the collapse of civilization occurring right now. There's a, a, a general uh, malaise, um, a stasis within the culture, a decay of the malaise, the, um, an absolute unravelling of the, the, the morale um, and the traditional morals of the culture as well. Um, and I make the distinction between culture and civilization. I, I would say that culture is, again, a sort of out, a, a more of a natural outgrowth um, of, again, that vital essence that's contained within man. Um, you could even say it's the tribe or the nation. Those are synonyms. The civilization is a more mechanized form. It's, I used the term in my first book. Um, I, I stated that civilization could be aptly described as agrarian systematization of human beings. So when the agricultural revolution came about, um, the, the mentality of man really it, it altered it. You know, it sort of evolved, you could say, around this new this new technological paradigm. And thus this new mentality really began to see human beings as crops. And this gets into your idea, uh, Guido, um, regarding insectification, or even the idea of the anthill or the, the termite-like society. Um, you know, the, the, the human farmer sees uh, the, the subordinates within the hierarchy as, you know, literal human cattle uh, to be herded and rotationally farmed within the, the, the urban pen, the urban polity. Um, you know, so, you know, of course we have that, that, that is everywhere. I mean, a, a death of culture and the onset, the full onset of civilization. However, in terms of the the advancement of the techno structure or the big data society or uh, this sort of clamoring within the, the the nobility, you know, the modern nobility for the, uh, w one could call it the, you know, autopoiesis, this project for autopoiesis or the homo deus. Um, we see every technological um, advancement and application is being suited towards the goal of genetic hacking, um, a, cent a mass centralization of not just power, because really power is, is merely an extension of uh, the control of information uh, or the control of data, as Zeal stated. So you're seeing all of this and everyone is acquiescing to this um, sort of uh, giving up of their privacy, either you know, uh, knowingly or unknowingly, to to this central uh, data collection um, that really has a data collection center that really has become the state. Uh, uh, you know, at this point in time. So, and of course, as well, there's a stakeholder class. I believe they call it stakeholder capitalism now. Um, so this stakeholder class is really. They're they're seeking this this system, this self-regulating system that you know they they believe will maintain itself into perpetuity. Um, mm. So of course, it, all the intellectuals uh, that I'm seeing at least are that are you know connected with Davos and what have you. You know the 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 power elite. They're all geared towards this goal. Um, and it's quite terrifying, actually. You know, it's very terrifying. Um, well, Guido, if if I might ask you, as 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 someone who's written about, you know, some of the stuff that happened in the twentieth century, you know, is there any, you know, and and you have a kind of an interest in, you know, the military stuff and history and World War One, World War Two, and all that came with it, and how the money kind of worked in and around all that stuff. But do you see that there's any potential? to strike back as it were and and if so like it, it appears that 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 horse is also bolted that there's nothing to fight against and you know you've said it in your essay it would appear that there's 
I mean, where would you, where would one strike, or how would you know? It seems to be, you know, an invisible, completely invisible enemy everywhere and nowhere. You know, it's yeah, it's uh, that's that's ex- it's exactly what I was thinking about that while uh, you were you were all, both of you were were saying uh, you know the movement the move the coali- the coalescing movement towards this unified structure. Um, yes. Uh, the f- sensation I have is, uh, for me, I mean, even though the system is, is, is very crafty and it's self-effacing, they're still there. I mean, we know that. And, uh, and all this, all this um, mythology or mythography that they teach in universities about, you know, it's so-called Foucauldian, and they don't call it like that anymore, but the postmodernist Foucauldian uh, imagery, it's all stuff that I discussed in the bo- this book I wrote which is called The Ideology of Tyranny, which at the time I was just interested in the um, political correctness in America, which I find like, which I, I, you know, snottily found ridiculous. And I really underestimated what I was dealing with. Because, yeah. we, but by the time this thing has grown and we see what it is now, in the 80s, it was just like something funny, cultural, yeah. some kind of cultural artifact. And now it's a system. It's actually not mm-hmm. a system. It's turning into the facade of the system. Mm. It is obviously an, an, a reactionary imperial technique of the Orwellian Empire, even though, mm. yes, uh, of you know the, the true empire is an empire of all now. And, and you see in the Netflix production, Hollywood, they're going for you know this this idea that the world is full of mixed races and so on and so forth, that, that mm. only under the aegis of Uncle Sam and so on and so forth. And uh, so in light of all this and the story that they've been telling us uh, in, in, uh, in, 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 in academia, in the U.S. and, and, and in England, too, and now the rest of the world is basically the story of the, you know, it's this power that doesn't exist. And this French uh, Foucault, uh, Foucault came up with this idea. Anyway, I'm not going to go through the whole story of the book, but it's fascinating. And, mm. he, 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 and, and there's this moment, the central moment uh, uh, it's where he just goes into this painting by the, the Las Meninas Velasquez, which is, you know, it's the, it's this portrait scene from the viewpoint of the king. It's the king looking at the painter painting mm-hmm. him, and, uh, but in him and the queen are reflected in a in a mirror at the end of the of the painting. And so Foucault says, this is what modern power is. It it rules by its absence. So this guy is an absolute hack, and, 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 and this was a genius move on his part. It's completely corrupt and untrue, but really um, fascinating. And the story is that he was a professional hack and an academic, an academic but the real genius behind this was this, was this um, genius was, who was Georges Bataille. Was, he started out as a Catholic seminarian, but ended up being an artist and uh, earned his keep as a librarian. And, you know, and you know Bataille. And Bataille is the one who invented all these theories about modernity and about the acephalous god. I mean, he is worth uh, a chapter on his own in a conversation. Mm -hmm. But this whole story about power, the machine, the behemoth coming to fight and to absorb and sink its, its hooks into the flesh, of you know of the of the human body which rebels. This is on Bataille, and Foucault re-elaborated. That. So they tell you the story in schools. So they, they got postmodernism, and as I wrote in that essay, they teach, you know, so they're all those guys and girls that are gonna go into the system, and they're all like perfectly uniformed and and you know, mentally speaking, and they're gonna go and they're gonna man the machine. And then there's the radical chic guys. They're also coming from an upper middle class, but they're the more rebellious types. So to them, they're going to feed them the other quote unquote discourses. This one is one of them. And back in the day was Marxism. And then they give them free marketeering, Mm -hmm. Austrian, you know, the free market. They Mm -hmm. they threw that at me when I was uh, in college and so on. And Mm -hmm. I even bought it. I remember, you know, this idea Mm -hmm. that the market organized everything. I mean, it's all horseshit anyway. But the point of all these stories, again, going back to the uh, to the uh, the metaphor of the beehive, and because Plato's cavern is the beehive, if you think it's all about, yeah. it's an eternal stories of us being trapped in a cage, and how the hell do you get out of the cage? All these other stories are telling you that there is no power structure, that is just economics, or is just like there is no real state. It's just you know, there's just. It's if if it's a Foucauldian, you got to rebel and then see how it goes. If it's Marx, you just got to seize the means of production, whatever that means, and then rule. And if you're the free marketers, you don't have to do anything. You just got to be successful. 
and and you will win. And they call that anarcho-capitalism. You know, some that just a term makes me makes me shiver, and so on. But the message of all these discourses they give you in school is to tell you, look, no matter what you do, you're free. And if you don't feel free, just empower yourself. But remember, there is no such thing as power. And and yeah. the ultimate of this thing comes from this Foucauldian French thing. It's the power is not there. It's it's at the margin. It circulates. You are the power. You are the empowered one. And so on and so forth. Now coming to the question, I've always thought this. Okay, so I fought against all that and I lost. Right? I could. I've been. You ask me what do you do? The enemy is too strong. I I was. I'm just. I'm just, a, as you say, a Joe Soap, and I, I couldn't do very much. I, I fought alone. I got all my teeth bashed in in academia, and, and, and this is repeatedly in America, at the Vatican. And so this is just my experience. But aside from my experience, the enemies is too strong. They're, they're too organized, too resourceful. Uh, you, you, you go for a, a head-on collision with them, you lose. So yeah. what I suggested we do is this. If we have a chance of trying to st striking back or, or defending ourselves or finding a way, it could only be attempted. Chances of success are minimal. It could only be attempted if we replicate a nest it close or nearby the big nest where you are seen the least possible. And the mm -hmm. only ways, they, it, they're not going to make you do it, but you're going to try to make you do it. And the two only ways that the system, when it doesn't use violence, controls mm -hmm. you are basically through taxes and through the banking system. So we have got a way of recreating a nest where we are able somehow to reduce these two tentacles that are just planted in, in, in our flesh, out of which they, they suck you know, the, the, the mm. lifeblood out of us. Mm. These are the two ways. So we have, and so this, I don't know, this is a long conversation. We, we have to be organized territorially in such a way that we could uh, we have to find a, a vehicle, like um, you know, like um, a juridical. Uh, um, uh, how do you call this? You know, not a, in in the U.S. they call limited companies or in whatever that that kind of thing. A form where you can create, you can uh, encapsulate your community and recreate an economic circuit where you shield yourself from these two viewpoints. You should be able to. Avoid taxation as much as possible, as regions with special autonomy do in certain countries. And the most delicate thing, be able to create your own mint and your own credit system in a way that it's not too visible, because that's also the other way with which they suck energy out of you. If communities can arrange themselves in such a way and spread over the, ter of the uh, territory and, and virally, this would be revolutionary. And it's the only way. You have to start mm -hmm. under the radar, and we would have to organize ourselves, and actually, technically, not to speak about these things at all in a public way, but we'd have to do it secretly, in a sense, uh, of mm -hmm. how to do this best. Uh, this is this is the way for me. The, the, these are the things I would. Where I'm working with people here and trying to see if other people have ideas of how to do this in their own countries and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, sir. I've had a uh, similar, um, a similar sort of train of thought regarding that. Yeah, a, a true secret society, if you will, um, a, a, you know, a parallel society. Um, you you brought up a really fascinating point in one of your discussions uh, on the techno structure, where you you made um, the point that the, the the new mint, the new medium of exchange, the currency, if you will, should reflect or m rather mimic uh, material possessions, commodities, um, or not commodities, more more like, uh, you know, the perishability of items. Right. Um, I thought that was a very interesting point and, and one that, of course, would spell doom for the, the, the sort of traditional central banking system um, if it took hold in a revolutionary way. Uh, manner um but yeah it's uh, that was a fascinating point do you, do you have any anything you could you'd add to, to, to that point or, or yeah i'll be brief because just uh, for the listeners yeah because yeah, adrian will, will chime in yeah that's what i worked on when i was doing was when i was teaching economics that was my main thing yeah it the state the um having a perishable currency money that dies is from a social standpoint the most revolutionary proposition there is there's no question it's it's the it's if you want to see somebody who wants to change the world, you'll see that are people advocating just that. The system will 
destroy you if it needs to, to prevent you from doing this, that is absolutely guaranteed because it depends on it. First, you were talking a second ago about the reliance on, on, on human flesh for work. Uh, speaking, and, and, and Silas, you were mentioning Gnosticism and so on. And I'm, I go back to that, that, that great buffoon of Aleister Crowley. And he said, you know, the thing, you know, the, the great British Magus, he said, yeah. um, great, whatever, the Magus. Yeah, yeah. Um, he said, if there's something that scares the shit out of the producers, it's not a strike, but a mass suicide. So, um, so they, 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 they got to be very careful with the rest of us bees or, or, or termites here because they need us. But, uh, yeah, those, those two are the two channels, taxation and, and the amount of interest they suck through the banking system. And, and there's a way of breaking this. We, we, we know, I mean, we ha it hasn't been tested very much, but we know how to do it. The question is how to implement it in an effective way in recreating a circuit in a parallel nest, which is some, somewhat separated from the main one. That is the challenge. But I think we have to try it. We have nothing else. But that is the, main, the most revolutionary thing is, for me, is a system that's truly revolutionary has to have a, a system with, a, with money parishes. You don't need to have paper. You can do it electronically. But that's, yeah, I have written extensively about this. And I'll, now that I'm going to relaunch my website, I'll put everything up there for downloading because it's, it's a very essential thing. It's, it's a very interesting uh, point. Absolutely. It's almost, one could describe it as covertly uh, drawing resources away from the, you know, the main nest. Uh, it's, almost a bit like the, the cuckoo birds in, in many ways, that we become the, uh, the parasites, but in a, you know, a beneficial way for the species, you know, going forward. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really interesting it, it, it proposition. Was attempted, it was attempted during the Great Depression in a couple of places. These, these are just the, the famous examples of all the, you know, those, the, those anarchists that, like myself and others, you know, have worshipped that tradition. And, uh, there were cases in Germany and Austria and, and where these bills, perishable bills, started to circulate so well that they, they went beyond the radius of the community in which they were issued because they were seeking right, right, to other federated cities to, to start the circuit. They were intercepted by the inspectors of the central bank and just immediately brought to a close. So we know, we know what we're dealing with. They will send you the cops if they find out if you're doing this too overtly and, and, and too well. So, but it's interesting. It's a challenge for us. We we've got to try. But uh, Guido, if I might ask, like you know, just briefly, what is the relevance of a perishable currency in in short? I mean, why is that so like central to the concept? The fact that it's perishable, or well, because the system extracts resources from us either by taking directly through taxation, excises, and all that, and the other way it does it is through. And, and, and speaking of eliciting participation from the rest of the population through our bank accounts, when mm. they say the money works for you, uh, okay, I get you. When the money works for you, you just put a buck there and then you expect it to germinate into one point, whatever interest they offer you. Yeah. Nobody yeah. asks himself where the hell that plus percent comes from. And the question is, where the hell do you think it comes from? It's a system that it, it, it's extracted from you, not exactly from you, because if you had a lot of money, you don't have to work and you just get coupons. It comes from the rest of the population. And the reason why people are so scared, aside from dying, as it was for the case of virus, they're blackmailable because most of the bleeding hearts and the, and the, and the good thinkers and, and people who would be generally on the progressive sides have that privilege. So they have, you know, interest yielding bank accounts. So they are by that by that fact, in the parasitical class. There's no question about it. But my point, I'm not here to judge. All of us do have them to a you know, greater or less extent, those, those accounts. But if they're, for a lot of people, they're a necessity because once you're in the system, you cannot go without them. But that's, if you want to strike at the system, no, that's its most important, I would say economically, it's its most important artery. It's right there. This, that where it sucks from, you know, the rest of us. It's through the interest, the gigantic amount of interest that are owed to them, to the banking system, and to those, to the big stakeholders of that node, <clears throat> into which the system governs. But not, it's not, not even as I said, it's the banks that rule. That's nonsense. It's a technocratic structure. The banks and this, and the government are together in this. It's one same monolithical structure. 
to which the whole thing just stays in place. But that's, you know, that's that's where those are two channels from which they suck ex- yeah. the most. Yeah. The, as well, just to, just to add, abs- fantastic postulation, but just to add as well, it seems that, you know, as inflation increases, and of course this leads to inflation, usury, whatever term we wish to use, uh, this, this germination of the money, this accumulation of it because of its lack of perishability. Um, this also ties into this really perverse notion of autopoiesis, where, of course, because the money doesn't die, uh, power re- really... It requires this sort of um, perverse inclination within its own, you know, uh, mindset to push for this sort of eternal system. This, um, uh, even if the system is a husk of itself, and of course, as the inflation increases, this causes civilizational problems. So it causes a lack of leisure time for. Um, the, the subordinates uh, below the apex of the hierarchy due to, obviously, the lessening value of people's skills and thus what they can gain from those skills, um, you know, as a matter of production. So because of the lessening um, availability of leisure to the entire hierarchy, that leads to a sort of spiritual death. People can't really pursue a uh, higher forms of, not distraction, but, you know, higher forms of, say, intellectual pursuits or spiritual pursuits or things that would bring, uh, you know, a communal benefit. Of course, course. but it's, this is on by design. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, of course, it keeps the subordinates subordinate in in many ways. But yeah, Yeah. Adrian was asking, you know, how is it related? But yeah, as you said, money... We are so weak in this battle against the system also because I was selling, telling to other friends with whom I was talking, we, unlike the system, uh, we don't have, we, we, we're weak on technique. Like, but I'm making technique like, mm. like musical technique. Mm. We're not as, we're, we're not as, you know, we're, we're playing, we're, we're, we're playing three chords against people who are virtuosos. Yeah. And I think that we have to start learning our technique. And mm. learning our technique is trying to tell ourselves, teach ourselves and teach our, our people how the system works and so to make them understand how it works and that would be a great step forward this is about the money is essential and money is a tough one to understand because as silas said it's it's what is money and it's it, if you think about it it's something it's deliriously absurd surreal it is yeah. something it is magnetic impulses that travel on a proprietary network that are somehow enveloped with the imperishable power of gold this is what they do. Gold has nothing to do with it was linked, but it was generally discharged from it. But traditionally, that's what, and the church never understood what was the way out of this. It's thundered against usury, but it didn't know where it came from. The fact that those who were able to corner gold were able to charge this bite, the extra, because their wares didn't perish, and those of everybody else did. And from this embarrassment came this exaction. This was something that was not understood up until the early 1900s, where this guru of anarchism was a former, was a former merchant, a, a, a former businessman, German businessman who, who, de- who made money in Argentina selling a dental equipment, figured it out by solving what traditional anarchists understood where the problem was, but could never figure out where and how to solve it. It was, you know, Proudhon attempted to do that in the mid-19th century. He knew that they that the monopoly of the of the Bank of France was was what was you know destroying the possibility of people of living that life of leisure, as Salas was mentioning, it was because it sucked. It was sucking so much through that interest, and he was proposing to create the Bank of the People, where people would bring their chickens and their doors and their implements, get a chit of paper in exchange for it, and then go into a market square and and trade. And it never worked because uh, because he wanted to transform the goods into the medium of exchange. And it was not that. And what this gazelle, the German businessman, understood, you had to reverse the project, reverse the idea, instead of transform of transforming the money into something that mimics the life of the good themselves. Just get a piece of paper and put an expiration mark on it. And you got the greatest 
piece of revolutionary economic genius that was ever, ever thought. And there's something so simple and nothing came up with the idea just like that. I wish I'd come up with that idea. It's not mine. But when I read it, I, 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 you know, it was an epiphany. And once you do that, you are just, you know, you are, as I said, you are incising one of the greatest notes. Of course, the inflation is never zero. Again, where do we think the interest comes from? You go to this, you sit in the banking house and they give you 100 and expect you to bring back 110 the following year. Where's the 10 going to come from? It's going to come from the banking system. So inflation is built in the system. And once you understand this, and I've written extensively about this coming from this tradition, and everything becomes clear, is a rent generating process is created by this. So once you're under the duress of the going back there, you got to find this 10, you're going to have to organize resources in such a way, you're going to have to corner the market and create scarcity enough, scarcity enough that you have, you're able to earn five profit for yourself, or let's say 15, you're going to have to make 15 on whatever you make. So you can give 10 back to the bank and keep five to yourself. And here comes, you know, the whole dynamic of what they call capitalist exploitation. But that's, that's not what it is. It's a rent generating process created by the alpha, which is the loan through this imperishable money. And from there on, everything is clear. It's about, you know, it's, it's a doggy dog, try to screw your neighbor business, push to the extreme. This is what it is. And the whole theory of Marxist exploitation is nonsense. It doesn't work the way he said, and, and all those people, you know, these leftists think they know everything. That's not the way it works. What it works is that in such a system, then when, when the producers start to compete and those margins, of, those margins of profits are reduced, the first thing they go and cut is labor. They always do this. Mm. And this, is, this is why Proudhon says, go at the heart of the matter and incise it right there. But I say yes, and now we know how to do it, and we know where the problem lies, but go try and see what happens. And this is what I tell a lot of people. There's other people also, the Rudolf Steiner followers and all that, and they're really sweet, we know, with their, with their, with their nice woolen things and, and nature and, and appeal to nature and so on. And they believe in all this, because Rudolf Steiner also talked about this three-articulate system that had to have perishable money. And I said to them, prepare for war, because this system is so radical. You want to create a nest that's going to subvert the one we're in. So prepare. But people are not understanding this. But it's okay. We are here. We're going to start, and we're going to acquire this technique, and we're going to acquire the, the velocity of the virtue, you know, virtuousistic ability. We will have to do that, or else there is no chance. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And uh, just No, I absolutely agree. Yep. Sorry, Zio. Go on, yeah, sorry, let's go on. No, I, I totally agree. It, it's yeah. almost, of course, you have to expect a sort of military response from them because in that sense, you're going for the jugular. You're going for the diametric um, opposite of their system. And, up, you know, all the way back since the advent of coinage uh, within Lydia, uh, within the, the 8th century BC. And you see the Babylonian houses that uh, funnily enough were they had monopolies over the bullion right the the mines and of course the price of the bullion from that and from that they began to there is evidence that they began to you know produce bronze coinage as a, as a sort of uh, fiat uh, currency an early fiat currency or fiat coinage but from that it almost instantaneously gave them a monopoly over everything else within the society. It gave them total power. So really, this idea of the invisible empire or power hiding its own, its own, you know, its, its presence, right? Um, making it, you know, this crypto oligarchy, it really is, it's all based around money. It's based around financial instruments. Uh, you, you can't even call it a medium of exchange, as you stated, uh, Guido. It's not really a true medium of exchange until we have money that mimics goods, mimics the perishability of goods. Um, without that core concept of perishability inbuilt into the, the, the system of money um, that we use, you're going to have uh, the sort of monopolists uh, constantly using the tools of technology and the advancement thereof for, in essence, the, the, the sort of a, uh, reinforcing, the, the buttressing 
of the plantation system that we're all now toiling under. So yeah, it's a really fascinating point. I I, I just had to bring it up in the conversation. Thanks for uh, you know oh, mentioning this, that. This, yeah. this is this is key, and it's something that will have to be common throughout. You know, whatever network we're able to create, there, there should be attempted. And the perishability itself is not enough, the critical though it may be. It's not the hardest part. I mean, we can set up a credit union with a with perishable, with a perishable money. You know, your savings account at zero percent and your checking account loses value, I don't know, six percent a year, because it forces money to circulate. You can't hoard it. That's the idea. So we can do that. What's really is gonna be really hard in creating the parallel nest, what's called parabiosis. In, in entomology is 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 and it's it's a beautiful literature of all these bugs that do want do, they do not want to be rated pet parasites and so they created their nest next to the big one but make it invisible and so they the entrances are full of traps and uh, uh optical illusion not to make them know that they're there it's amazing it's amazing what what, what these what the insects do and we're going to have to do the same and for me, the challenge, and we have, a, I have a group of people, and we're thinking about this daily, how to do it. And it's uh, you know, the time for gurus and, and philosophy for is is over. We have to get organized. Uh, we have to organize practically these days. And and I I confess my my the difficulty because I'm just a talker. But we're gonna need people who are good in organizing business wise this stuff. And um, and and uh, so. Being able to create, it will be the beating heart, will be this, what I call the communal mint. Never call it that because it's going to attract the attention. Give it some kind of anodyne name like Bureau for Exchange or whatever, or even less. It's, it's, it's even too revealing. But the most difficult part that we're encountering as we put together these projects is uh, recreating the circuit, right? You're going to recreate a parallel economy. So you got to get resources out there and convince them and we're going to... And, and 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 you're going to issue money linked to agriculture so you're going to have a few farmers that have to join your project convince them it's good and you have to recreate a, a self-contained circuit all of that requires a lot of work it's very difficult and a lot of monetary activists will tell you that but um but that's the route we we have to do that and you know it starts you're going to have your own little supermarket but that's how it should start but the money you just don't now i'm going to the technicalities of this and i'm it, might not be interesting, but this is kind of very common topic oh, for yeah. people who are interested in in monetary form. You just can, and because you know, you know very well this. You've heard of, and I'm sure in Ireland, I don't know, I'm don't remember exactly, but I'm sure there have been plenty of these projects afoot of creating mm -hmm. regional currencies, and you must remember some of them. And all of them have the, the the flaw, the defect of just being tokens thrown at thrown at the community that ended up by not circulating at all. So we're trying to overcome that. It has to start with the agriculture. So the money has to be put in the hands of those who make food and then go from there. And if, along the cycle, you go from artisans and then finally you go to the third sector. You may build schools, theaters and clinics and so on. And then you close the cycle in classic form. Um, the perishability is an essential component of that, but recreating the circuit is also extremely challenging, technically speaking. But these are the things that should occupy us in finding avenues of getting outside of the hive and 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 finding the time to have that leisure that I was mentioning where you cultivate yourselves. But these are very, I don't know, for me, my my central book is, uh, is Thorsten Veblen's The Theory of the Leisure Class, which is the most important text of social sciences of the 20th century which is very much an analysis of the uh, of the parasitical classes, what he calls the leisure classes, and how they have impeded humanity at a juncture where it finally had the technology to live, to be able to work just a few hours a day and enjoy the rest, and it prevented that from happening. It is told in this amazing, I cannot describe it like more enthusiastically enough for what a beautiful book it is. It has a classic status, but nobody reads it, you know? But all this, this what Silas was mentioning it, <clears throat> he calls it spiritual debilitation. And this is why, and he explains also why there's this, this pin and this understanding between the upper classes and the lower reaches. They're very fully barbarians. The ones, you know, reactionaries and unchanging because they rule, and the ones at the bottom because they're kept in such a state of undeveloped barbarousness that they naturally understand each other and you can see them communing in stadiums you know and so on and so forth mm -hmm. um but uh but yeah you know that we have kind of a different vision of what things should be but it's, it's as i said the challenge well it seems like you you have a market 
for the idea and to try and answer an earlier question you you asked me what possibly could the power structure fear you know and and that is um, an uncontained or a market for such an idea that would resonate like resonance would be you know something like that could resonate across national lines and could become an idea and you know with the with the technology etc that we have to hand you have a new a new a new dynamic like we haven't we've never been here before you know we've never been as a species at this exact historical juncture socio socio historical economic point and this is new terrain so something like what you're talking about could just be a, a snap moment where there's a reaction that something catches on and like we've spoken about this previously myself and silas about artifacts or you know within the promulgation of the new system you have x factors unknown unknowns moments that will be that will come from the spontaneity or the, or the chaotic spark of, of, of human organization and ingenuity and such a thing like what you're talking about might catch on and that's that would be a huge fear i think for for the structure and i uh, hope so i would hope so it's definitely something we have to try and very much on the down low <laughs> yeah yeah under the radar. does there's a sideways this is a slightly sideways question i wanted to ask you about your idea and lately we've had some you know arguably rather fatalistic conversations where we have uh, discussed the the idea that society really is at a state of is in a, a cyclical point of decline altogether and um you know our bride to be is on the table and she's been given a diagnosis a diagnosis a couple of hours to live and what the question i have is to to the you know the economic doctors are we to try and revive her or, or was, she, was it better that we let her die gracefully gently so my my question is: Is there still fight? Is there still fighting us, Guido? Is there still a f um, is there still a battle to be won, or where are we on the scale of things? Like you know, and is something like this still a viable? You know, as you used to use your term there, we ha something we have to do. But where's yeah. your head on that? Like, yeah, well, <laughs> it's a thing I think about it every day. Um, I don't know. I I, I think you know. I think I think we've lost the battle. Right? But, you know, like in good samurai tradition, there's one more reason to fight it. There's very few of us yeah, out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I remember when I wrote Conjuring Hitler, I thought I was going to be, <laughs> I don't know, some kind of, I mean, I was just full of it. I, I was just so, I was so immature, so, so naive. I thought I was just going to be some kind of, you know, big band leader and everybody was going to just sing the tune. And I just, you know, I, I wrote this book, I turned around, I saw nobody, and then they just beat me into a pulp. And that was that. I mean, uh, um so we're, we're there's so few of us so few but yeah uh I, the enemy has never been stronger the fact that they um the fact that they project a political battle between two you know octogenarians like biden or trump just to maybe to give the impression that the system is just out of breath is such is such a joke is such a is such a put on i think that system has never been so strong and vital as it is now as i've been as i've had opportunity to observe throughout my life especially since 9-11, which the big turn of the screw was imparted to the system. Uh, that, 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 that date is, is not, let's not forget it, it's huge. Um, but yeah, who cares? You know, uh, I, 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 te I, tend, I tend to, to, get, to lose myself in despair, but, um, but it's, it's, it's a healthy despair because it just, uh, it just makes me say, yeah, you know what? Yeah, I, 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 will, I will just attempt until the end. Yeah, and, and yeah. Whatever. Well, there's another probably probably way of looking at it in that the customer is always right, and those who have jumped aboard the the current uh, you know stampede into toward oblivion are quite happy to do so. They're quite happy to be in the cave, as it were. So perhaps there is room for a parallel, as you said, a nest outside the nest that might yeah. foreseeably be able to exist on its own kind of basis. Yeah. In yeah, you were, mention, you were mentioning this. You were saying you talk to the guys and they say, look, I'm great here. I, I, yes, but if, if, you, if you can show them, if you can give them an, a, you know, a card and an access to the yeah, parallel yeah. nest where they can, they, they, can, they can see that they can actually earn something and, and, and earn yeah. some leisure time, 
they will join, if, the, the, no doubt. So this is yeah, what we're yeah. counting on. This is what we're hoping. Will we succeed? It's a different story. But, but the potential, no matter how limited, is, is there. Is there? I agree. It is, or else I wouldn't bother, right? I, I think as well, you know, relating back to what you stated regarding, you know, uh, I believe it's Tolstoy, you know, you have barbarism at the, the, the apex of the hierarchy and barbarism. The law, of, know, the, the law of violence, he calls it, you know, very important. Absolutely. But I, I think in those hierarchical settings, and of course that intensifies the longer the, the civilization goes on. Um, and of course, when the culture dies in this sort of mechanized, uh, really, you know, technicized form of civilization takes hold, you, you begin to find, even though the, the society may claim that it's virtuous and, you know, pacifistic in, in, in a sense, it's extremely violent. It becomes hateful. Hatred abounds and all of this. Um, but in that system where you have barbarism at the bottom and barbarism at the top, mm -hmm. you, you find that it's a sort of hammer and anvil effect because those of us who sort of, you know, are processed within that sort of violent uh, uh, womb, if you will, you, f you find that we take on a sort of um, directly opposite set of characteristics. Mm. We become more intellectual, perhaps yeah. we cultivate our spirit more, yeah. perhaps we cultivate ideas, Guido, like you have, uh, regarding parabiosis, where we use the, the sort of, this system, this or this decaying culture, rather, not the system that, as you state, the system isn't decaying, it's stronger than ever, but this decaying culture we use that as a sort of fertile breeding ground um for you know the pursuits of solutions you know and i i think that's what we can do we can use this sort of ground of death for that new system for that new um parabiotic system you know as you state yeah yeah that's what we hope yeah i think we we have got to try and and Guido, your your sense of the thing generally from people you speak to either online or through you know your your publishing or your academic your your work in the universities, what is your sense of the mood in the camp? Is there an appetite for this kind of an idea? Do you think there is? There is and not in academia, of course, but amongst the people, there's growing awareness. And as you're saying, I, you, I think you're mentioning the same about situation over where you are you know that, that they feel something is just not quite right but they don't know mm. what it is the awareness is is very much in italy too in a way for instance that uh, some friends of mine were telling me that it wasn't so up until a few years ago covid has been a big has been a big factor in this surprising for me i mean covid did nothing for me but apparently it it it, it, it punctured a lot of people into a, a higher state of wakefulness and uh it's yes yes there, there's there's greater awareness there's greater desire of of, of hearing proposals for change yes I, yeah. I that's that's the case that's what i've heard and i, I believe it's true well if you mm -hmm. pardon the expression um money talks or perishable money talks bullshit <laughs> walks so you know if there's if there's some you know if you can if maybe there is hope for the you know some sort of a external system or method of exchange or you know if, if yeah. it can be as you say given the heart if it can it can be if it can be proved to work that it works yes yeah no 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 the onus is on us is on us uh yeah the, yeah no, we, and we, to ask uh, you a kind of a kind of a newbie question to this kind of stuff are you are you in breach of any sort of uh you know constitutional legislation such an idea at all well well, we would have, yeah, speaking of when the discussion should go private, we, we would have to find, I was saying, a, a juridical vehicle. Uh, by this, I mean maybe, I don't know, a status, a particular uh, juridical status that shields this uh, endeavor when we launch it. Uh, so we'd have to work within the law, but there's no question that we are trying to reduce, you know, like churches, okay? Or like trade unions, or uh, I don't know what the laws are um, in in other countries, but in Italy, uh, you have special status if you have if you go under these uh, if these species of, uh, sort of of 
social um, agreements. Then the states, the state gives you room for paying fewer taxes. Uh, so that's what we got to do. We would have to find ways, but then you'd have to work with CPAs or people who are really crafty with bank law, banking laws, and and um, and you know, and, and those kinds of things, and and to craft a a structure that shields you from from these things. And then, of course, when you'll be able to nest inside this juridical box, your call it your credit union. Um, we have to see how that works. Uh, it requires, this is why I'm all saying here to, to my people, we need to uh, get on our side or recruit um, some accounting and legal uh, um, expertise mm. to help us mm. with this. Mm. Yeah. So perhaps the final manifestation might look like a federation or a bank, perhaps. What I, what I, what I, I, would, I would see just in Proudhonian anarchistic terms, what the future is like free cities federated, tied to one another in one giant mesh, and each with its own mint, communal mint. And yeah, that's just how it should be. Yeah. And people would say, well, that's chaos. Nonsense. I mean, how do you convert from the, uh, the money of, I don't know, a little, French, a little French village to your own? No problem. Think about them. The gazillions and, and the talent that we spend in our banking system, it could be done in. <laughs> yeah. Well, be... you, could argue, you could argue we're all we're in chaos. This is chaos. This is the normalization of chaos is the status quo at the present time. But look how yes. people are employed in, in our world. <laughs> nope. mm. No way. Yeah, it, it could it could be done. But yes, as you said, you know, talk is cheap. Yeah, we now now we can dream as much as we want. We have to show that we are able to do something. And no, yeah. to finally try and I have a word for you. I answer your early question, your earlier question. Is there anything, and this ties in with what you've just been saying, is there anything the power structure as is might fear? And that is our capacity to adapt. And what you've described is adaptation in, in essence. So uh, I think yeah. it's a great idea. <laughs> I think it's a perhaps you know I, I would just I would just, love, I would just love to see the gauges they look at, you know. I I always ask, I ask friends and everybody. Do you think there are gauges they look at? I don't know. Population indices? I don't know. Something. There must well, be. If, if you take Stafford's beer, Stafford Beer's um, concept there, what, what was it Silas said? Operation? Project uh, Cyberson. I beg your pardon. Project Cyberson. So you have this concept where the entire, firstly, the entire corporation, and secondly, an entire country, Chile, I think, in the case of Cyberson, was controlled from a single room. So as you say, as your question, Guido, Guido, what are the gauges? Like, all you have to do is set the parameters. So over time, if you're involved, we'll say, in economic management of a country, you have a fair idea what are the critical things to look at. The, the, again, the, the, the metaphor, you know, the, the, the oil levels in the engine, the water yeah. levels in the radiator, the battery is charged, how much diesel have you got in the tank, uh, you, know, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you have a very good chance, if you can set your variables, of getting a really good picture of uh, what's happening. Like So, you know, if you take the Project Cybersyn, the kind of centralized apparatus for essentially surveillance management and, you know, operational decision making, you, you can craft a system that will give you very good data, you know, and learns on the spot critically. Nowadays, we're looking at that as well. So not only when you engineer it in, in, at the initial stage, it's like a prototype, and then it becomes version one, version two, version three. It, it self-updates because it's monitoring in real time the behavioral yeah, outputs I of, 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 the, of the, the termites, as it were. Yeah, I don't, I don't doubt it. I wish I, I wish I were at the console, too, to see what they look at. I'm just yeah, curious. exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah. you can imagine, you know, if you've got enough money and enough time, you can build such a machine, you know, of course. Uh, yeah, of course. yeah, I know. But our game is to figure out what they do. It's like a, it's like a mystery novel, you know what I mean? Because yeah, they yeah, do yeah. stuff. And they, they don't tell you, but they do. <laughs> Well, we know them by the artifacts uh, of the, the outputs of their, um, yes. you know, their various objectives. So we, we, we're, all, we're studying behavior ourselves. Ironically, you see, the super irony of all this is we have kind of become them in a way, a kind of a micro version of them. We're, we're playing the same game, like we're, we're watching them. You know, we're talking about creating, a, you know, a method of exchange, which is 
has been unhooked from state structures. <laughs> it's, it's all what they did essentially back in the day. So yeah. ultimately, it's, it's the it's the highest form of flattery's invitation. You know, it's kind of. I know you, you can go further than that and just say that you know because you know Silas was mentioning Tulsa a lot of viol- law of violence. It's like all we live for is to smash them. <laughs> so we're just just yeah, as violent yeah, as they yeah. are. Yeah. Exactly, in a sense, in a sense. But it's all good natural fun at the end of the day, and we, sh- you know, hopefully we can shake hands. Uh, you know, at the end of the game, off the pitch, and uh, walk through the gates of eternity together, and like good buddies, we kind of forget about it all. You know, <laughs> I would hope so. I would yeah, hope so. Yeah. So I kind of get the. Uh, shall we? Um, the side is there anything else you want to put in there? Um, I'm not sure we want to hold up Guido too much longer. Or... No, no. I, I think we covered most of the points I want to get to yeah. um, regarding the techno structure. But it was yeah. an absolutely fascinating essay. Um, when I upload this, Guido. Just send me any links to to your books. Uh, of course, the ideology of tyranny. Yes, that's a fantastic book. Conjuring Hitler, another fantastic yeah, book. That was an. So idea. I highly recommend. Yeah, that was. Books, a, yeah, I'll send you. I'll me. send you the files for sure. And if I don't know, Guido, you want to pop in or out here? You know, you have the emails now. Don't be a stranger. You you want to just pop in for a chat or bounce a few ideas around or whatever. You know, you're more than welcome. It's great talking to you. Yeah, it was talking same here. Yes, I I have yours. I think oh Silas is uh, is copied on somewhere. Yeah, he's on the thing there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll uh, I'll retrieve that. <coughs> Super. Thank you. Thank you for this. Thank you, sir. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. We'll be in touch. Okay, All Silas, the best. Take care. All the Great best, man. Thanks. Great talking to you. Ciao. Take care. Ciao. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye.